Have you ever collaborated with scientists? Like you, you want to be a surgeon? Have you ever thought, of, or have you ever been requested to collaborate with a, a doctor or a scientist? You know, I've never done a collaboration like that. I know that there was, in that there there was at one point there was a group called Art and Technology, and they mm -hmm. it was a, all engineers and artists put together. I've I've collaborated with with generally with other artists when I have collaborated. Mostly I've sort of worked in a solitary way. But I think I mean I I, I, I would expand that to say that maybe in some ways um, indirectly I've collaborated because every time I've uh, seen anything uh, that the engineers are doing, say at MIT, like in the leg lab, or in robotics, or uh, all the different disciplines, I know that I'm affected by it. I mean, everything that I see affects me. But in a direct, collaborative, collaborating way, uh, I haven't done that. I haven't really been specifically asked to do that. Yes? Um, can you say something about your permanent exhibit at MIT, yeah. about that, how that came about? The, the exhibit at MIT, it's been there for, uh, I don't know, 20 years or so, a little bit less than that. Um, when, I, when, I had, when I had an exhibition that, that where, where machine with chair was at the De Cordova in Lincoln, Mass. That was the first sort of uh, one-person show that I had. And some of the mechanical engineers from MIT found their way up there and got into it and went back to MIT and just started to write all these interdepartmental emails. And then more people from the engineering world at MIT went up there. And then they got interested. So then that led to uh, being in, invited by the Office of the Arts to do a, a residency which went on for four years where I was, actually this is kind of a collaboration, but where I was, I was working with the engineering students, junior and senior engineering students at MIT and giving them very different kinds of problems to solve. It was, it was one of their classes. So I did a, I did a residency and then the, the exhibition started on campus. and. It just, it just resonated with the MIT community. So the MIT Museum decided, rather than just close the show down, they moved it from this tiny little gallery called the Compton Gallery, which is off the Infinite Corridor, if you know MIT. Uh, and they brought it up to the museum, and it's just sort of been ongoing. And it's been kind of the most wonderful thing, because I can put pieces in or take pieces out, and uh, people a lot of people get to see it, so it's a great opportunity. And it just sort of happened. What's this thing that you do at Thanksgiving time? The, the, the Thanksgiving thing that Alan is talking about, there's a chain reaction project that I do with the MIT Museum. And uh, this is, now that's been going on for like, this is the 14th year. They, they always had a program called Friday After Thanksgiving, where they would do something for people who didn't want to go out shopping <laughs> after, the day after Thanksgiving. So then they came to me and they said, you know, can we do something together? And I said, yeah, maybe we can have like a little chain reaction where people could build parts of a chain reaction. And the first year, the first two years, I think, it happened in the hallways of the MIT Museum. And these like long chain reactions, and then it just was impossible to see. And it was a thing where anybody could build anything. So we had families and kids, some teachers, some students, and people would just bring things in, and we link them all up. Uh, very much in the spirit of Rube Goldberg. And I mean, chain reactions are really huge now. They're all over. They're amazing things all over the web. But uh, it 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 slowly evolved from. Uh, an event that happened in the, in the narrow corridors of the MIT Museum, and then we moved downstairs, uh, and, and then it, and now it happens in the gymnasium because it's just sort of grown, and we, we usually have like 40 teams 
of families that come together and they bring they bring these these beautiful crazy devices that they build and and we have a we have a a rule that allows them to link to each other so everybody in their own home or basement the week before the night before two hours before they build something a wonderful contraption and the 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 primary rule is that it starts by pulling a string and it ends by pulling a string. So you can then tie strings together and then one will link to the other. Um, now we have a golf ball that travels through. So you can also, you can be part of the golf ball challenge where, where, that, where, where, where you would accept a golf ball into your device and you would then need to raise it up and do something with it and then spit the golf ball out. And it sort of travels around. And it's a really fun event. We have a lot of people show up and it's crazy. And the, the, the most beautiful thing about it is that there is completely unabashed invention and creation and problem solving from all ages. Uh, there is just the most incredibly um, thoughtful and funny uh, things that, that, that are brought in, uh, very often they don't work. And it doesn't seem, <laughs> but it doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter when something stops working, then, then you usually have what we call the hand of God that comes in <laughs> and helps it along. And then sometimes something, something like there's like, like a, there's a time delay like built into it and like, like maybe they, I, I, what, one year a team uh, used, used the principle of soaking a, a paper towel and they had a weight on the paper towel and so they, they, would, they would soak it and I guess at home they timed it and it was like an sort of appropriate amount of time before the weight would fall through. You know, the, the water bottle would drip and start getting it wet. But then the day, like the morning of the chain reaction, they ran out of that paper towel and they must have gotten <laughs> What's the brand that doesn't break? <laughs> Bounty, whatever. They got a different brand, I'm telling you. The whole, you have a, you have a gymnasium full of like, like 1,400 people watching, watching a little thing. So it's just fantastic. That chain reactions are the most beautiful like uh, forum for for like mechanical theater and tension and drama. <laughs> so if any of you can make it down Friday after Thanksgiving at MIT, and you can also do it here. You should do a chain reaction here. They're great, yes. Yeah, you just mentioned problem solving again. Uh, and it seems like from beginning to end, you must have an enormous number of problems to solve in making these machines, and yet earlier you said that you weren't into or you didn't use the, the calculations to figure out the equations. And how do you do it? How, your work is like the most graceful, whimsical dance of materials. How do you make that happen? How do you solve those problems? Well, m most, of, most of it is, is thought about in a spatial way. So there, there, there are some calculations that I will use which just have to do on a really simple level with things like ratios and speeds of things and you know gears are extremely simple in terms of if you have a gear of a certain size and you have another meshing with a gear twice the size that's going to go you know half the speed, things like that. It's going to have twice the power. I, mean, I, 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 can, I can do simple calculations like on, on that level. Uh, I'm not interested actually in thinking about things like stress or, but, but see, most of, the, most of the things, most of the essential aspects of the sculptures are not calculatable because they really have to do with how does it feel. And you can't come up with an equation that will tell you how something's gonna feel. That just has to be experienced. So I think my approach to what I've learned about engineering has all come from building something and experiencing it and seeing like, what I imagined, what results, and learning, learning about 
all of the mechanical principles that go into making things move. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking physical objects and moving them in space and moving them in certain ways. That's one aspect. That's the engineering aspect. And there's, 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 no, there's no way to calculate an approach to a problem. It just has to be found. So sometimes, well, very often, my initial imagination about how I'm going to solve a problem mechanically, it will be wrong. I'll start to build, and I'll realize, oh, no, it's not, not moving properly or not working like that. But it'll suggest an alteration and a change. So the final piece gets arrived at after a kind of circuitous pathway of building. Um, So, the, so I mean, the, the, the engineering aspect of the pieces, is, I feel like it's kind of the tiniest aspect. It's, it's, it's kind of like color theory to a painter. I mean, that's, that's really what it is. I'm very interested. I, I, I love the machine, and I love showing the machine. And I don't want the pieces to be magic tricks. I think that's why I love all of the parts of the machine to be shown. Because I think that the real magic happens in the in the mind of the viewer when they see they see you see all the parts happening. But if the if the end result if, if the piece can then transcend its simple mechanics, and that all of that is has nothing to do with anything that can be calculated. It just has to be felt. So it's kind of like engineering and feeling. The same, the same time. Intuitive engineering. It's a totally intuitive engineering. Absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes there are parts to pieces like that. That little um, child watching ball, right? Mm -hmm. That that's following that ball. The most critical part of that piece. I mean, I, I there were no equations in that. There were simple ratios, but but really it was just thinking about the problem spatially. And the most critical part of that piece. Uh, I think I was just like immersed in, in trying to see it move and dream with it. And there's a critical part where there's a little bar in the center of that piece which is rocking back and forth. And there's something sliding up and back uh, along that bar. And there's a point where the bar, uh, if this thing is sliding along the bar and that bar is, is um, rocking, then the point of, of sliding when it gets to the far extreme is much greater, or it, the, the, the rocking back and forth is greater. And then as it reaches the center, it's less and less and less to the point where the rocking back and forth has no effect upon this. And then as it moves back, it starts doing that again. But the most important thing of that piece was that the, the, the direction of the way of the looking just happened to coincide with what I needed to... That's like way too... Technical, but... <laughs>